Hello everyone, welcome to this session where we are going to discuss what Kuma is, what it does and how can we use it. So Kuma, how it works, what we can monitor with it and why is it different? So who am I? Let's start with the introductions. I am uh, João Esperancinha, I'm a Java, Kotlin, Groovy, Scala and a developer and I've been a software engineer for about 10 years and I'm the owner of the JazzProtect channel for about one year. I am a certified Kong champion, Java professional and a Spring professional. And let's get started with our presentation. So what is Kuma? Kuma is a platform agnostic open source control plane for service mesh and microservices management with support for Kubernetes, VM and bare metal environments. This is in their uh, source documentation and what in general terms means is that Kuma is, um, is a control plane that allows us to control how data flows between our services within our own network. And to see how Kuma works, we need at our basis at least one application running or several services running. And that is what we are going to do on the first chapter of this video. And that is getting the services up and running. So we are going to need a couple of things. We're going to need an application running that communicates between different services and we are going to have to deploy this in a Kubernetes environment and also we are going to need um, to start the services and to send data through and across our network. We are going to need uh, different kinds of data traffic and let's have a look at the summary for chapter one. So before we even begin exploring Kuma we need a complete cluster and a functional application system. That's what we are going to do. We're going to have a look at our application. We're going to have a look at which commands we need to install to have this working locally. We are going to create a cluster, a local Docker registry. And the reason why we are going to create a Docker, um, sorry, a local Docker registry is because we need to access our images somehow within our Kubernetes environment. Uh, this can be difficult, but fortunately there is a very easy way to do that and I will explain that also in this chapter. Uh, we are going to have a look through the code and see how the code works. Uh, this is just basically to have an idea on how the code is configured and structured. Then we are going to have a look at the deploy scripts and see how the containers are being deployed in our Kubernetes environment. And we're also going to have a look at how everything is running using canines. But I will tell that later. Now, oh, and the, and the last uh, point of, the, of chapter one is of course running the demo application. And this is all even before we start using Kuma. So let's get started. Step one, our application and what it does. What our application is about is a, is a wildlife safety monitor kind of application that is going to essentially monitor where and what is happening and what is happening to different animals that we want to monitor. They will have a sensor attached to them and we're going to receive the data from those animals and then work that data in our environment and show that data in a way. The application is constantly being developed and it is available on this link that I put down here at the bottom of this slide. And, uh, and at the moment it's not complete, but it is enough to make this video. So let's have a look at what it is supposed to do. This is the general overview of the application as we are, as we want to have it working in production. And the way it works is we've got users on the internet that can check data from, uh, uh, from the website that's being served here with Nginx and it has a, an Angular application running. Uh, it's going to go through the, through the Kong gateway and it's going, the, the UI is going to 
check data from the management service and the management service it's only an application that will uh, have a look at the data of the animal, allow us to create new data for different animals, different uh, names and setups for the different uh, animals, and assign sensors to them. But the actual uh, data begins here. So in our specific example that I'm going to talk not only in this video, but in following videos, is an example of an albatross that is traveling around the world, and it has a sensor associated to it, where we can find its location and what is the albatross doing. Uh, of course, for now, this is a very simple implementation of it. It will develop into something different and it will also go through a, a gateway. So this incoming traffic will cross two different, um, two different networks, which is also known as north-south traffic. So data that's coming from the outside to the inside or vice versa. In this case, is only, uh, is, uh, the data flow has only one direction from north to south, from the outside to the inside of our uh, organization. And it's going to go through here up to the listener. And the listener will get all of these events from the animal and it will relay these events to the collector, which will then process the events and send them to the uh, to the database where the raw data from the uh, sensors is being stored. So we will be able to know at, uh, at, at the beginning the location of the, al uh, of the animal. And of course, Kuma will control all of this by injecting these sidecars and these sidecars will be injected automatically and it won't they won't need any manual assistance at all, uh, which is one of the benefits benefits of using Kuma. And these are all Envoy uh, sidecars that Kuma will manage for us. But of course, this is not the example we are going to have a look at. We are going to have a look at a very similar example. And that example is this one. So here I have removed, it's, it's or at least I have grayed out the things that we are not going to use, and that is the GUI, the aggregator, and management. Uh, I didn't mention the aggregator. Uh, the aggregator has a goal in the future, and that is to get all the data, work the data through, and create new data points that we can use in our GUI automatically and directly without having to, um, to spend time processing the data over and over again. So that's what the aggregator will be doing, but for now, we are not going to uh, deploy it. Um, and so this is the only thing we're going to do. And if you notice, I have removed the Kong gateway from this diagram. And the reason for that is that uh, this is about Kuma. This is not about the Kong gateway. Um, this, so our video it has to be as focused as possible on, uh, on Kuma. And so we are going just to focus our, our application in the data flow from the sensor up to the listener, relate to the collector, and then finally to the database. And we, have, we will have all of that management managed by uh, Kuma inside our uh, network in our organization. So the next step is installing all the commands we need. What do we need in general for uh, to, to create our cluster and all of the things we need, uh, Kubernetes and um, and to have all of this application uh, functioning is uh, we need a cluster to get our pods running. We will achieve the cluster creation with kind. This is uh, Kubernetes in Docker. We will need to create a local registry and kind will allow us to create that very easily. We will also install kubectl, which of course is a must. If you have some experience working with Kubernetes, then you know that we really need to install kubectl. And uh, we also need Kuma CTL, which will allow us to configure uh, Kuma. Uh, although we will see that we will use mostly kubectl to make different uh, installations. So now we would want to install the commands for this. But I want to show you first 
a list or let's just say a compilation of the different commands I have uh, used to make this installation. They are all uh, compiled into a bash script that you can run in a Linux machine. I have not tested this in Mac OS or Windows. I will eventually put uh, scripts to installing these machines in this repo but for now it's only available for Linux uh, Ubuntu machines but you can use these scripts to maybe find out how to install in other systems so let's have a look at it and so the name of the file is is install all Linux dot sh and it starts out declaring that it is a, a bash uh, that it needs to run on the bash environment and we're going to install Firstly, this is not really necessary for this video, but uh, it's already here because later on it will be. This is the Angular client uh, command. Mm, but the one that is really necessary is kind, of course, and kind is, uh, we can install kind directly, just putting it into the bin folder using this command to, uh, to download it, and that's it. That's as easy as it is to install kind. This is also available in their website, which we should now have a quick look at. So kind is kind Kubernetes. Yeah. So kind is this um, command here. And it says here kind is a tool for running local Kubernetes clusters using Docker container nodes. Kind was primarily designed for testing Kubernetes itself, but may be used for local development or uh, uh, continuous integration environments. So basically, it's a very complete uh, command. It is very interesting to use. And in order to install it, as I showed you, you we, we just have to issue these commands. I would say for now, let's install it and see how that goes. So I'm just going to copy these three uh, lines. So we're going to do this sequentially to see how everything works together. Um, all right, so now it's just downloading it and now it's asking for my password, of course. And now it should be it, now it should be installed. If I just do kind, it should work. And the reason for that is because it doesn't need environment variables. It simply puts the command into the bin folder, which is already part of my path. So if I, if I issue kind, then I see the command is already available. Okay, now we have kind. Let's go to the next step. And the next step is to install a bunch of certificates and keys uh, and GPG keys because we want to be able to add a, a certain, uh, we want to add two repos to our Linux environment. And for that, we we need to make we need to install the GPG keys and this will add two things that we need and that is the um, uh, the sources for Kubernetes and the the source sorry this is the repos for Kubernetes and the repos for Helm which I didn't mention before but we can we are go also going to install the uh, Kuma dashboards so we can see uh, live with a UI uh, using our browser, what is happening in the uh, in the Kubernetes instances and pods that we are running and see what kind of features are installed on each and every pod. So this will add, the first one will add the repositories for Kubernetes and the other one will add the repositories for Helm. The other command is of course, we need to make an update and then we are going to install Helm, the kubectl command, and extra two commands that we may need in the future, but not really for this presentation. But then you have it already in your uh, in your machine. So let's first do these in one batch in the command line. So let's do that. Let's go here and do this and run it. So I have to overwrite the uh, the key ring for Kubernetes and that's because I had already installed it before. Of course, I'm doing this for demonstration purposes. So some of the things are already installed, but this is what we should see when we uh, add these repos. And of course, when we update. Uh, now let's install 
the rest of the commands that we need, which is kubelet, kubeadmin, kubectl, and helm. So now we have all these commands installed. So we can check the most important ones. kubectl, is it installed? Do we have access to it? Yes. And helm, also available. So we've got helm, kubectl, and we also have kind. We're missing Kuma CTL. Let's have a look at that. And this is the easy step. This is best to install in the home folder. That way we can have more control on where Kuma is installed and how do we want our system to be configured. All right, so now it's installed. Um, I have already pre, I have some pre-installation things in my machine that make this already work out of the box. But the step that you need to do is whatever your shell is, in this case, I'm using, I'm using ZSH. If you go to your shell start, um, you will need to install this. You'll need to add this to your path. So it needs to be in the bin folder. So as one last command or even a part of your path build, uh, your path environment creation, uh, you need to add the location of uh, Kuma. And this will give you access to Kuma cattle. Now we have cube cattle, Kuma cattle, um, helm, and we have kind. So we are all set up to move on to the next step, and that is the creation of our cl cluster. So let's do that. So step three, creating a cluster. To create a cluster, we only need to issue a simple command, and that is kind create cluster, dash dash name with the name of the cluster. The second command, kubectl cluster info, is just to, um, to gather the info of uh, of our cluster but there is an easy way but there is an easy way to do that and the easiest way to do that is to use canines you probably heard of it but if you have I will just talk a little bit about it if we go to our browser and we search for canines we can go to this web page and uh, it is in the shape of a dog because canines and we need to install it and it is open source and can be difficult to install because the ways to install this is either using, using Pac-Man or using Brew. And Brew, uh, I don't know if you noticed, I didn't use this, there is a Brew version for Linux. And so you have to install, first you need to install Brew for Linux and only then you can install um, canines. I did it that way and I've added that to the installation script right over here where we see that we, if we run this command uh, this will install uh, the um, uh, this, this will install homebrew and and then all we need to do is add this to our uh, start script for our system. In this case, I'm using ZSH. So let's have a look at, oh yeah, I have it already here. See, we have, I have added this to the end of, uh, of the initialization script. And then finally I can make, I can issue brew install uh, canines, but I already have it installed in this case. So if I go canines like this, then I have it here and I can see that I already have uh, they already have a cluster, actually. Name, yeah, so that one is gone. And I think we can also delete kind. Deleting cluster kind. So if you go to Kubernetes again, there's nothing. This is what we want. We don't want any cluster running at the start of the, to, to make this, uh, 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 to make this installation. So now we start from scratch. So um, so let's continue. Um, first things first, kind create cluster dash dash name, and we're going to call it call it WLSM. 
So wildlife safety monitor, mesh zone, just to follow the, the same topology that's in the original tutorial in the, um, in the Kuma website. So let's do that. It doesn't need to have this name specifically. So it takes a while to get this uh, installed. And we can see the, uh, <clears throat> the progress of this if we on another uh, screen. So let me now split the screen in two. Uh, like this. Okay, so now we have created this cluster and we need to consider one thing when we are at this point and that is that canines has a tendency to crash if we delete the cluster in the meantime or if we put a new cluster in. It doesn't handle very well new cluster changes, at least not with this version. I'm using version 32.4. Uh, it could be that in newer versions this won't be an issue, but um, the cluster itself, the change of the cluster, uh, really messes up a bit the uh, canine's uh, configuration. So take that into account. Now that we have our cluster installed, we can check the changes with canines or we can just issue a command line like they mentioned right over here. We can just uh, type in kubectl cluster info context and then the name of our cluster. Well, in this case, the context name, which is something a bit different, but not important for now. I didn't want context. All right. So now we see that the control plane is connected to, um, is running on port 34487, and that the DNS server is, uh, the core DNS is running on this address. We just need to issue these three commands. So if we issue them, right here. Uh, now I'm not using the um, um, the make file in this case because I want to show what happens immediately as we are making the changes with canines which is part of the beauty of using canines in this case. So let's start it. So what this is doing is installing Kuma charts and it is installing a control plane so that we are able to yeah, as I said before, see the status of our pods. Um, it's performing the install, and we can see that it's performing the in, that it is performing the install in the namespace Kuma system, which is also a way that Kubernetes has things uh, organized. So now that Kuma is installed, you installed, you would think that you could easily go here and watch and, and see the the web page uh, on this address, but this is running inside the Kubernetes cluster. And so we don't have immediate access to it. For that, we need to open a port. And I also have in the makefile scripts, a place where we can see how those ports are opened. So this, we can open our ports, um, port forwarding, yes. So these are the different ways we have to open our ports, only that I don't have here the port that we need. The port that we need actually is port 5681, and we can find this in this at this address. This is the Kubernetes demo tutorial uh, for Kuma. And if you run this command, it will block the our bash uh, command line and but it will forward from the inside the cluster uh, port 5681 to outside the cluster to port 5681 so then we are able to access the GUI and that's right over here we can also access the root which contains information about Kuma GUI and the Kuma control plane but in this case, we are interested in seeing what's going on here. We have one mesh, but there are no services installed yet, and there are no data plane, data plane proxies. So there's 
not much that we can do right over here and using the GUI we can check how things are going uh, but we can't do many changes uh, we can check the diagnosis of our cluster and see how, how is everything going we have access to uh, quite a few configurations and we'll come back later to this um, to this control plane but now it's time to move on to the next step uh, but before let me just uh, yeah so this is the control plane that we just installed yes so let's uh, continue so let's recap what we have right now we have created a cluster called WLSM uh, mesh zone and we have installed uh, the Kuma control plane so one is a GUI the other one is a cluster but we have not installed any container yet and we have not installed anything related to Kubernetes so now let's create something that is very important which is the uh, local docker registry the local docker registry uh, bases itself on the registry colon two image available in docker hub and it allows us to register docker images in our own local machine which can be a bit of a headache if you're doing it manually and if you want to do it with your kubernetes cluster because of course we need from the kubernetes cluster to be able to access our local uh, image registry which seems like a simple task but can actually be quite difficult but I found out in uh, the kind website that there is actually a very easy way to do that and that is using their own script which is kind which with a registry but before I run this script let's first have a look at what they say in their website so in their website <clears throat> uh, in this URL we can find this script and it says that the following script will create a local registry and kind and the kind cluster with it enabled now we can go through this script up until the end but it's just a question of understanding how it works because essentially what it does it does a mapping between port 5000 which is the container port and 5001 which is the port we are going to use to access the registry both from the outside of the cluster and inside the cluster the great thing about this thing is that after we run this script which we don't even have to understand how it works we can simply just push and get images from there as long as as, as we as a prefix use localhost um, colon and then 5001 so let's install it and to do that I want to first of all show let me close this one this one is not necessary let me just show the um, the make file no let me first show the the script actually which, because I have installed it here and uh, I have I've placed it in my own repo the kind with registry and here we have it and the uh, I simply put a reference at the top saying that I've taken this out from the kind uh, website and so we can run it now and if we run this we should get our registry uh, locally up and running but I want to do that from the perspective of the console so that we uh, can see if there anything if there anything changes in the uh, that is detectable by canines so let's do that so first we go over here and then we go to source dev and then let's go to our wildlife uh, wildlife safety monitor folder and then let's just uh do kind with registry let's start it what it will now create is a new cluster called kind and one of the things that we 
are going to realize here is that kind is one cluster and our cluster is kind WLSM mesh zone. So we are not going to see it directly because as I mentioned before, canines don't detect this uh, at the moment very quickly. And so what I am going to do is just shut down canines and then restart it. And now we have at our disposal two different clusters, the kind and the kind WLSM mesh zone, the one we've created before. Let's have a look at kind. What does it have? It has nothing. It has no pod running at the moment. And it doesn't need it because it's just a cluster we created so that we can use uh, the registry. Um, now, one of the things that I have created also in uh, my repository is a simple make a file script to create the different images of our projects and push them to the registry. We are going to have a look uh, after this. Uh, we're going to have a look through the code a bit to understand what it, how it works. But right now, what I want to do is just to push the, to create the containers and and uh, uh, push these to our um, to, sorry to create these images and push them to our registry. So let's have a look at the script before I run it. So the script is this one. So we go to make file and here at the top, I have a script that will iterate through this module tags variable, which is an array of different um, locations, aggregator, collector, listener, management database, as we have seen in the diagram before. These are all different services that they essentially have exactly the same way of calling the build. They have different, slightly different implementations, especially the database is much different, but the way to call them and the way to create them is pretty much the same, uh, with the exception of the name of the service itself. So the, the makefile script will run through all of them. And what it will do, it will build the images and it will push them. Of course, previously, we must have the images already built. So what I do is I call make B. B is just the build script that builds all of the different modules because I have modules here built with Java and other modules built with Kotlin. And the make B uh, script just builds all of them with Gradle and creates the jar files that we need to use in our containers. So let's build it and wait for it to finish off. Let me see if there's anything else that I can tell. Yeah, uh, in this project, you'll find a lot of clean scripts, by the way, as we are waiting, uh, cleaning scripts that will reset the machine, especially this one, uninstall all, might be useful. If you install all of this stuff and you don't want to have it in your machine for whatever reason, then you can just call this script or try to modify it according to your system. Uh, so I remove kind here, I remove Kuma, the Helm scripts, I do perform the auto remove to um, to get rid of uh, lost dependencies, loosen dependencies, and I also perform a manual remove of kubectl and Helm. Should you have them yet? Should you have them still in your machine? Okay, now the build has been completed, and then now we can now safely call the the create and push images script. So we just call make create and push images, but I will do this from the other command line, not from IntelliJ, this one, make, create and push images. So now what's it doing? It's building all of the images of the different modules and it will take some time now. You might as well in that time have a look, uh, we might as well have a look at other things in that time. Um, so in this, I also have um, I have this remove all cluster. Um, <clears throat> so with kind, we can remove all the clusters we may have in Kubernetes, which is very handy uh, if we are trying to get a fresh start uh, when we are testing things, but also in other situations where you, in your own machine, you had something installed and you want to remove it. And this provides you an easy shortcut for that. I also have the whole script and the whole instruction sets to um, to install the different command line 
uh, uh, prompts, uh, uh, the, the different commands uh, that we've installed. Uh, the only thing is that this doesn't work very well with this make file and some of them fail if you run it this way. Uh, let's just check how is that going. It's still, it's pushing now. So it's now pushing the, uh, the different images um, and it has completed, which is nice. If we now run Docker, PS uh, Docker images, actually, we will see that we've got a lot of images. And we see that we have a, a repository with localhost 5001. Uh, all the all of the five images that we need. We've got Kuma, we've got the registry, we've got Postgres because we are using a Postgres database. We've got this one is for, from Kind. We've got these ones which are important for uh, Kubernetes. Uh, we've got Eclipse Tamarin, of course, because they are running in this uh, JDK version. Um, and that's about it in terms of important images that we have just installed. And in terms of Kubernetes, nothing really has happened. Let's refresh it. Okay, so there's no pod installed in this uh, cluster. So now we have the images created. Uh, it's about time to actually start our cluster because having all of them installed, I believe that there's no other thing we need to do. Yes, so this is what we just did. We built our images and we've pushed them to our local registry. This is not the, the typical local registry that we usually have in uh, uh, by default or maybe on the fresh installation of Docker Compose. This is a registry that is available in both locally and in uh, our Kubernetes cluster. So step five is going through the code. So we are now going to have a look at some important aspects of the code so that we can understand how these services will communicate with each other in our cluster. Um, as we look through the code, it's important that we take a look at the three services, but for now, let's have a look at two that are very, very important. One of them is a listener service and the other one is the collector service. The way they communicate with each other is by using the uh, domain names of each other and these get assigned automatically once we make the deployment in the Kubernetes cluster. The way they work and the way they are defined is by their names, by the namespace they are using and the cluster they are using. Because we are not doing cross-cluster communication, we can just stick to using the local cluster. So the configuration of the domain on the right side will not change. It's pretty much static. And on the left side does changes a bit. So let's look at the first example in the listener service. Of course, we want to relay the data that we collect from the listener service to the collector service. And that uh, means that we need to reach the collector service. And the collector service has this name, WLSM Collector Deployment. We will see this later on. And it's been assigned the WLSM namespace. Then we just need to follow that up with .svc, .cluster, .local, and then add the port. And then finally, the path to the endpoint that we are sending the data uh, traffic to. The collector service then is just responsible for picking up this data, collecting it and saving this data in the database. And for that, it needs a database connection and needs to know where the database is located. For that, it builds the name of the uh, service, the, the main name of the service in exactly the same ways. So on the left side, we have WLSM database deployment dot WLSM namespace and then finally SVC cluster and local with the port 5432 and the database we need to connect to. Now this is very important but you're probably asking what is this namespace that we're talking about? Well a namespace just like in many places in software development and engineering are, um, are just a sort of abstraction where we can isolate different uh, paradigms or services or objects too. And in this case is no different. We have every time we want to access the pods that are located in different namespaces, we need to specify the namespace they are in. And so 
let's have a look at a bit of the code for the time being and let's have a look at the listener service where the the database firstly enters from the outside to the inside this is also called frequently the north south traffic they travel from north which is the outside of the organization to the inside of an internal network of our organization so this is usually said that is data traffic that is uh, inbound to south uh, or in this case we can also say this outbound to south from the outside perspective so leaving the out to go into the internal network of the organization you get the point but essentially this is where this is where it starts so it does have a, looking at the deployment we see that it's located in the in the WLSM namespace and we see the deployment script and we see the service we'll have a look at the rest of it later on but if we look at the uh, configuration of this service which by the way is a spring boot application and it does have application properties and in the properties we find a typical configuration for spring services but also we find a configuration of the collector service endpoint and for the default configuration we see that the collector is located on port 881 on local host this configuration is available here if you want to run these services locally uh, in your local environment without any container management application um, but if we look at the application prod properties which is how we are going to deploy these services we see that the wls the wslm url collector property has a different configuration where indeed we are specifying the the location of our collector service in, in the same way we just saw in the slides and that is valid also for the uh, for the collector service it is also another application and we see that in in the default properties there there is localhost and in the uh, production uh, uh, properties we see that it's trying to reach the database using the namespace and using the same configuration we saw in the slides um, also important to notice is that all of these uh, server-side uh, developments are being made in Java and Kotlin again to make that point I, I have uh, gotten used to uh, note is that I I kind of do I kind of enjoy Java and Kotlin in the same way but um, let's now continue because now we seem to have all the configuration ready to start our deployment but before we do that it's important to have a look at our deployment scripts for Kubernetes so let's do that so step six making the deploy scripts okay so we've got here uh, the whole uh, definition of a deployment script and let's break it down and see what is happening here so on the left side on the left hand side of this slide we see the uh, the first thing that it's declared on that deployment script and that is the namespace which we need uh, because one thing fun fact we cannot use a default namespace to do a uh, Kuma sidecar injection Kuma will always complain that there's no namespace assigned it needs the namespace so so you know now up front that you do need to define a namespace uh, for these situations um, and one of the things that Kuma likes to use is labels and labels here are crucial you need to have this label kuma.io slash sidecar injection uh, colon enabled so that Kuma can recognize this as a deployment that needs a sidecar injection so this is how you get the sidecar injection in your uh, next to your container finally uh, we have two more blocks of configuration one is the deployment you probably are used to that to this uh, there is a difference from this deployment script to others that you have may seen on the on the web or in other more standard configurations that we use uh, environment variables in this case I've decided not to do that because it would add a level of complexity that I don't think it's interesting for this video and so I prefer to do that using the docker files and use the uh, uh, the entry points the bash entry point scripts um, to start out the application with the prod uh, profile in our spring applications so that's why it's very simplified and uh, and and of course 
We have another thing that is important here, the image pool policy. I put it to always because I want to keep on making tests and make sure that I get the most refreshed container uh, as possible. So the images where we make these containers, it's important to uh, not use any cache for our tests. This might change in the future, but for now we'll leave it this way. And you can see already, as I mentioned before, we're going to fetch we are going to fetch our images out of port 500, 5001 in localhost. This works because we have made the um, our Docker registry to be available as localhost inside of the Kubernetes cluster and outside of the Kubernetes cluster. Finally, we define our service, and this is just a way to provide an, a port that we can open it with port forwarding on our uh, console and therefore allowing us to access the services directly. It's, it's also necessary to deploy the services inside uh, Kubernetes. Now let's have a look at the, at, the, uh, at the other scripts. So we've got this one. We can have a look at how the database is being deployed, for example. So here's the database service. <clears throat> Nothing different when it comes to the uh, actual database deployment uh, because we are using uh, uh, an image that we are creating ourselves and not directly the PostgreSQL image from Docker Hub. Also in this case, because we want a database configured, we want to use our own script that creates the database, so this one, and we also um, may have a look here. So we, we have the uh, these environment variables that will establish that the user is admin, password is admin, and the database is WLSM. And this is it, basically. So now we kind of have an idea of how all the containers are configured. And I have made already scripts in the make file so that we can, can start our container in one go, much the same way as I have created the scripts for the uh, uh, creation of the images and pushing them into the local registry. In this case, what am I doing is simply apply this script, k Kubernetes apply deployment, which what it will do, it will, um, it will go through all of the modules, which have a standard name. I made this convention so that it would be easier to uh, to deploy them and then just apply every single one of these deployment scripts and make all the services start automatically for us. So let's do this. Let's make k okay, uh, Kubernetes apply deployment. But of course, I'm not doing that here. I'm going to do that here so that we can observe that in uh, in uh, canines. So let's do that. Um, make um, K8 apply deployment. So now all of the pods will start at the same time. Well, not at the same time, but as, as I apply the, uh, the deployment scripts, let's go. Okay, to the right, we see immediately in canines that, uh, that we already have gotten the five containers that we are looking for. Well, we've got now four pod, uh, five pods. We know already that, uh, let's see, the management doesn't work and the aggregator doesn't work because they have not been implemented yet. So of course they don't work, but they are already available and they are already being deployed. So having said this, let's move on and see our application running, at least what we can use of the application that has been developed up to this point. So for that, let's move on to the next chapter, which is running the application. So here's the, the thing. I probably went a bit too fast here because the idea was to show at, at this step the apply uh, scripts, but we've done it already, so that's fine. So all we have to do is just test it. So how do we test that? Uh, I have made here at the uh, root of the project these uh, scratch pad. Uh, scratch pad is um, test requests. So here we have different different requests, and of course 
one of the things that is very important to know is the uh, the animal ID. I will explain that in a bit, but first let's have a look at what, what we have here. I've got a get request to our ser to our listener service. I've got, it. it's just to get an info to see if the service is running or not. Uh, then we have a post request to create our uh, our location of the animal. So this is the sensor data that we are working right now, just the latitude, the longitude, and the animal ID. And then finally, if we want to just go straight into the collector, we can also send the same data to the collector and see how that works. But the one thing that we don't have at the moment is the ID of Piquinho. For that, let's go to the database because we have Piquinho in the database and we know this because one of the things that we have already created when you start out the script is this schema which essentially contains a table families, genuses, species, animal, anim, an animal location. And we can have a look at these in the in entity relation, relationship schema. Let's just have a quick look at that so that we understand very well where we are. Uh, so diagrams, show diagram. Yes, so here we are. So we, we what we have here is... Um, essentially um, a somewhat sophisticated database scheme where essentially we have a list of families, a list of genuses, uh, and a list of species, which are a combination of families and genuses. And finally, we have our animal that we define with the name and species ID and an ID. And then we have the animal locations that are essentially connected to each other via uh, via the uh, the uh, animal ID. So we know that at a certain point the animal has had this uh, location. At the moment it doesn't even have a timestamp but that's not needed for the test that we are that we are performing. So this is a, this is the uh, the entity relationship model and of course it's very simple and that's the whole point of it here and in the data we are already throwing in the, the, the genuses, the family, the species, and the name of the animal that we are going to monitor. And this is the Phoebostria uh, genus of family Diomedidae. Uh, the species, of course, is an albatross, and the animal is Piquinho. Let's have a look at him in the table animal. And... Yes, of course, we cannot access it. But the reason why we cannot access it is because we still don't have any port forwarding uh, done. So let's go back to our tab. And here, let's create a new view. Let's say, let's split this view into two, top and bottom. So here, we are going to create a port forwarding for our database. So let's do that. Uh, in the make file, I've put all of these together. So let's make a port forwarding here and and go right over here. And now we see that we've opened the port and now the port 5432 is open so that we can, we are allowed to make a database connection. So let's do one and check on the animal table again. And now we access it and now we have the ID of Piquinho, which is this one. And we can put this one in our test scripts and let's try <clears throat> the um, the um, the post where the sensor sends the data to our services. So let's try this one. But as you probably have already expected, if we send a post request right now as it is, we won't be able to reach the listener service because, of course, we didn't do any port forwarding for port 8080. Let's do that. So port 8080, we have it here on our scripts. Let's go here and then here let's just create another division here not a split view um yes this is probably a good one and then we can put here the um yes so we now have port forwarding to the listener service let's now do that <clears throat> but before i do that let's check first the animal locations table to see if there's anything there. There's nothing there. Okay, so now we are ready to send our data via these post requests, and let's do this via the listener service. 
as we send the data it takes some time and I have a service error okay probably a good idea is to rebuild it so let's try and do that Ah, it makes sense because we did not. Uh, I've I've made a, a quick fix. I changed default to WLSM uh, namespace, and that's probably did not went yet with the uh, images. So let's see if that's really the case. I believe so. Make teardown. So I also have this script that will. Uh, uh, We'll make a teardown of of the um, of the services. So let's see, and we'll remove all of the deployments um, because I I want to make sure that we are having everything fresh. So right now I'm I'm uh, basically deleting all of the deployments, which is uh, if, uh, we can use it. We can see the script right over here. Um, So the delete, yeah. So the these are the um, yeah. The teardown will delete all of the all of the pods, and it will ignore if they are not found, so that we don't have an error. So, okay, now they are down. Uh, let's re remove uh, registry. Let's uh, remove registry yeah remove registry means that so we're actually going to remove the registry that's not what I want but I want to um, what I want to do is to make sure yes yeah, so this will remove all images okay so let's make create and push images so now we are going to make sure that we have the right images in our uh, registry and now let's restart everything again make k8 apply deployment it has now been created now we have to go back to our other scripts this uh, I doubt that this is working so I will just uh, Restart it again. Oh yeah, the pods are pending. Of course, we just applied the scripts, so now this one is working, and this one, oh, also not. Let's try it again. No, they're not working actually. Okay. Uh, Coop CTL get pods in all name spaces. Name Spaces. Well, they're all initializing. Some of them are running. Some of them are already are still initializing. All of them are running now. Okay, it took a bit longer. Um, okay, so let's now do the port forwarding. Okay, and probably here also restart the port forwarding. And we can see already in uh, canines that everything is working. Okay, let's see if the this now works let's uh, do uh, create it doesn't work hmm. no but this one does oh yeah of course it doesn't work because now we've restarted it and so we have we do have a different um, we have a different animal ID Let's see if this works now. Yeah, so post. It did work. So now the listener is working. Whew, so that was a tough one. 
<laughs> so yeah, so uh, it is now working and uh, it it goes through all of the all of the um, all of the loops. So, so it get, gets it to the listener service, relays to the collector uh, service, and then goes into the database. And if we go now to the database and check our animal locations, then we see that there's one already there. And of course, this is not the idea, but we can also send this to our collector service right over here, and we can just post it, and then we have the. Um, our example and so now if we look at the locations also via via the collector service we see two locations being added and this will happen over and over and over and over again um, we have added a, a topology uh, to allow the the traffic to go in through the uh, the different um, sidecars but this doesn't do anything different to the uh, to our mesh and but before we do anything else, let's just have a look at the actual um, the actual uh, um, Kuma control plane in the GUI and see what it has to tell us right now at this moment about our pods. So let's go to the make file and go to the Kuma control plane um, over here and then do here a port forwarding to this port and then it's 5681 remember that so local host 5681 oh not 81 81 there we go we've got them here and we also have a link here somewhere to the GUI but it doesn't work so I just do GUI actually it does work it's here GUI and now we see that we've got five data plane proxies. So these are all our uh, five pods. Again, the database, the listener, the collector, the aggregator, and a fifth one, which will, let's have a look at it, services. We've got the aggregator, the collector, the database, the listener, and the management, of course. Um, and now we can have a look at the policies that have been in, in place. We've got one circuit breaker which is there and we got a mash traffic permissions so this uh, is something that uh, allows us to establish permissions between different pods too let's see uh, if we can remove the mash traffic permission go to details yeah um, let's get here Can also delete it like this I think ha there we go <laughs> we have deleted it <laughs> okay it's very simple so to delete we just need to put the same thing again again and instead of using apply we use delete and that is removed we are now entering chapter 2 of this video which is about exploring the Kuma features that for the uh, cluster that we have just created we have just seen how the mesh traffic permission uh, Sli we've seen slightly how it works. We have only able to apply it to our mesh. Let's revise that again in the command line. So let's go over here and see how we did that. So this was the Kuma system uh, for the, the, the Kuma system namespace using the MTP uh, mesh traffic permission uh, topology and this feature is now active, but of course it doesn't make a difference because by default it allows all traffic to go through. So now if we look at the, the next slide, we are using a feature called Mesh. And this Mesh has a specification, which is the MTLS specification. So what we are establishing here with this one is mutual TLS between two uh, or more uh, uh, services. In our case, we are going to apply this to all services at w it, at one time, and this means that all the services will have to certify who they are to each other. But we, as users, as uh, configurators of our mesh, don't need to worry about the certificates and the installation of the certificates. This will do Kuma for us via 
the uh, uh, Envoy sidecars that it injects next to our containers. So let's apply this one. So uh, I have here in the readme file all of these um, examples, if you want to have a look at. Uh, they are the same uh, of the ones that are uh, presented in the demo. Uh, I just modified them a bit to our, uh, our own services here. So let's see, uh, we've got the uh, mutual CLS topology. We can apply this right over there. Um, and this one uh, will, uh, will, as I said before, activate mutual TLS. Um, we do receive a warning. The mesh's default is missing, which is required by KubeCL apply. KubeCL apply should only be used on resources created declaratively by, declaratively by either KubeCL. The missing annotation will be patched automatically. Okay, we can ignore this warning. It's not important for this video. Uh, what's important is that the uh, mutual TLS uh, uh, feature has been applied. Let's have a look at that in our um, Kuma control plane. Let's have a look at it. Uh, so we need to go here to the browser and we need to go right over here. And if we refresh uh, this page, we are going to see that we have a circuit breaker still, mesh retry, mesh timeouts. So one way of checking if the uh, if if we have the MTLS configured is by using this command kumaCTL get mesh default o yaml uh, and default is the default name of our current mesh which to where, to which we have applied MTLS. Uh, let's uh, just um, let me just save this command here uh, because of course we're always learning. Um, so this will be, let me add a script. Uh, in this case, this script will be um, um, check mutual TLS. What this, uh, this uh, mutual TLS means is that when we are accessing the different, when, when the service is trying to access another service, it needs to have uh, accepted the certificate, just like usual TLS works, and vice versa needs to happen. So the 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 two services can only work with each other, can only communicate with each other if they both are communicating via uh, TLS. So what mutual TLS means in this case is exactly how we communicate via TLS. It means that when I want to, when when I receive information from from a certain service, for example, when I receive data to, for example, establish an SSH connection, uh, what happens is that I need to accept that certificate that that service is presenting to me. Therefore, I am confirming that I trust that service. At the same time, if I want to communicate back to that service, that service needs to accept my certificate to, to make sure that it accepts who I am and therefore trusts my data. And this two ways of trusting data, this is what it's called mutual TLS in very, very simple terms. And this is what we just did. So all of the different services are now communicating with each other via TLS via the Envoy sidecars. But they are still able to communicate with each other because if we now use our port to send data to our cluster, we are still able to do that. And let's have a look. Yes, we are just able to send another uh, location to our database. And if we look at the database, we will see all of this data. Now, we may not be able now to trace back which one was it or if we even sent any data. So for now, let's just, uh, let's just quickly uh, get a script. Um, so let's truncate the table. Use delete statement instead of truncate, delete from animal location. So now in principle, all the data is gone. So there's nothing there. So let's now just run again this post request. And there we go. It 
the request went okay and we still have data in our database the difference is that we are using http normal requests to use to send data to our um to our cluster but of course that's for test only but between the listener and the collector and the collector and the database the communication is being done via tls why is this important to have a, a tls um uh, communication between these different services why is it important to have the data encrypted between the servers inside our organization this is to prevent bad actors inside our organization people who have been able to infiltrate our organization for uh, as an example so those people will now still have another problem because they will not be able to listen to to the data or to eavesdrop in the data that's being communicated between different services inside a network. So, this is one thing, but of course, we still haven't seen anything actually in concrete. Uh, what we can now try is to stop, is to completely stop the, the data traffic. And for that, we can use this script. So this script right over here prevents the data from going anywhere inside our network, period. Nothing will happen. So essentially, I will still be able to send the data via uh, the via the port forwarding because it has nothing to do with the uh, with our uh, with our mesh. But from that point to any other of the services it will not we won't be able to send any more data so let's try and do that let's go here again to the um to the readme file and let's deny all traffic so i'm going to pick up this script right over here put him up here and just send it so now we have the we are denying traffic to all of our services Let's see what happens now as we try to send data to our uh, to our cluster. Let's post it, and it's still working. And now it's not. It takes a few seconds to get everything configured, but now we cannot send any data to the listener. We cannot send any data. We can still da send data to the collector. No, not anymore. That was just the first call and because they're all being updated as we go along. And so we still got two of them, but now we cannot send any more data. Now it's done. So now we have limited all traffic inside our topology, but we may want to allow data between different services. Of course, we want to do that. And we may want to specify that one service doesn't want to communicate with this service or this service shouldn't communicate with this service. Sometimes it's just a question really of safety. If the service doesn't need to communicate with another service, why should we allow it to? So we can prevent that. And that's what's great about the, uh, that's also what's great about Kuma is that we can do that very easily in this specific configuration. In this configuration, what I'm saying is that I want to allow all communications from the the um, from my um, I want to allow all the communications from my collector service to the database deployment. And what this will do, it will allow the communication from the collector to the database, but not from the listener. So let's try that. So let's go again to the readme file. I have it right over here is the last one of these scripts for now. And let's now allow this one. <clears throat> Okay, there's a problem here, I think. Yes, this is not needed. Okay, <laughs> so uh, we've just uh, uh, configured this policy. And now let's just have a look at what happened. 
if we go to our test requests and try to send another request via the listener, it shouldn't work. Not at all, and it doesn't. So we keep sending and it's still 500. But if we do it via the collector, it doesn't work now, it doesn't work now, it still doesn't work, but now it does. Again, the, the, the policies take some time to, uh, to take effect. Now it is there, it is active, and we are now able to send requests to the collector, but not via the listener. Because of course we didn't make any exception for the listener. So let's do that. Let's create another one. Let's go to the uh, readme and just create another one, another allow policy. And this policy will be a bit different. So let's say, um, let's call it WLSM not database. We're going to call this collector. And now we need to follow a few, th a few of these rules. Of course, uh, when we are talking about Kubernetes, there are rules for everything. And one of the, and these rules are sometimes just the names. They are just in the names of the things that we have. So in, in terms of target reference, uh, where we want the traffic to be redirected to, we have the kind of the same thing as we had for the DNS. So the first element of our composition is the name of the service. So this will be WLSM collector deployment. And yeah, and then an underscore, a, 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 a character separator, which is in this case, uh, an underscore for the DNS case was a dot and it is and then we put there the namespace uh, where the service we want to reach is uh, assigned to and then underscore SVC underscore and then the port this is for the target and for the source of the traffic which will now be the listener it's exactly the same thing so WLSM listener dash deployment underscore WLSM namespace underscore SVC underscore the port. The collector is 881 and the listener is port 8080. Okay, so that uh, that was a small mistake we didn't saw. So let's try it now. Okay, now it's configured and now we should be able to send requests via the listener. Let's see if that works. Yes. Okay. So now it works. So now we've got the listener and we've got the, the, the collector. We can reach both. But of course, the idea is that the listener can communicate, can relay data to the collector and the collector can save data in the database. And this is one of the things that we can do. And the good thing about it is that we've got mutual TLS between all of these three services. So anyone located in a different, uh, 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 in a different service, say someone who has access to this cluster and on a different service, the only thing that you will be able to see between these different services is pure gibberish, which is, which is a part of the TLS communication protocol. And another thing is uh, they won't be able to send data to these services because the mesh doesn't allow that to happen. So these three services are now protected and are now protected by Kuma, our bear. So uh, the data from Piquinho is protected. So these are uh, basic features available in Kuma. We can have a look at others. So for that, let's go to their website and have a look at what Kuma further has to offer. So we can go here to explore features and we've got a whole range of them even the mesh uh, traffic permissions, and of course the mutual TLS. These are the two that we have just seen. They are both related to security, but we can also do something else. For example, the mesh fault injection. Why not do this? The mesh fault injection will allow us to simulate fails in different services. So let's have a look at how to do mesh fault injection.
Let's now have a look at another one of the features provided by Kuma. For example, the mesh fault injection. This can be very specific and we can specify the traffic going in this case from the listener to the collector uh, to the collector and we're going to say that half of it is going to fail. Um, so the moment we do this injection, we are going to simulate these fails. This is important if we are trying to make tests, for example, and we want to simulate certain failures in our application. Now, this can be another area where Kuma can really be helpful. Uh, it is the area of just testing. And so we don't need to program anything specifically in our services or make another uh, cluster that would be dedicated for testing. This is simply just having the topology managing manage that for us. So let's do that one. Um, let's select the uh, established fault injection policy and let's apply it in our command line. All right, it has been applied. So we are now expecting that 50% of our requests to the collector service will fail. Remember, we already have mutual TLS. We have got uh, um, we have got a mesh traffic permission specific policies where we specify exactly where the traffic is supposed to come and go to. Um, so east west data traffic, and now let's see what happens when we send our requests via the uh, via the listener. So first request. It's okay. Second request fails. Third request is fails. Fourth request is okay. Okay, fail. Okay, fail. Okay, fail, fail, fail. fail. Okay. So this is like a 50% of the requests, but not in any particular order. So they just keep on failing and, and running and failing and running. So, but we have specified listener to collector. What happens now if we send via the collector? Can you guess what's going to happen? How many requests will fail? Under normal circumstance, circumstances, of course, not if something now very unexpected happens. We should expect not a single fail. So let's send via the collector. Okay, 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 okay. Because we specified the origin and the destination of that policy. So these are uh, three examples of what we can do with Kuma. There are a lot more that we can use and, and they are all listed here in the features, in the explore features of their website. It is important to understand that this video is more to keep you up to date and keep you, and keep you up to speed to what Kuma can do and eventually Kong Connect. connect. Um, and of course, Kuma, uh, and of course, uh, Kong Meshes, which is a project that came out of this open source project. Um, I do want to make another video because this video is already quite, uh, quite long. And it, this video was, I created this video specifically so that you could, uh, also easily start, uh, learning about Kuma and start playing with it. Uh, this is what will happen in the near future. There will be another video about the whole structure of the application and what it is doing, uh, which will be about the completion of the uh, functionality of this whole application. And then there's going to be an advanced video about what Kuma can do uh, for us, but using all of these things, because the next step is to go uh, heads on on what Kuma can do, especially when when it comes to observability metrics, especially when it comes to advanced things like mesh pro proxy patches, the DPCP security. Um, we also want to explore all of this traffic control. For example, one of the things that is very interesting is the mesh circuit breaker. If things get too hot for uh, a certain service, how can the circuit breaker react? in this way for us and what can it do for us. Uh, we can also uh, think about the uh, mesh health checks. So figure out how is the mesh behaving as a whole. Um, and this is about it for our presentation. 
So now we just reached the end of our presentation. Let me just tell you that this has been a great presentation to make. I really enjoyed doing this. It is a bit chaotic because it's like the one of the, uh, I think it's the first presentation that I'm making with so much uh, uh, related to common line usage. And so um, these are the resources that I've used to create this uh, presentation. I hope you have enjoyed it so far. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't forget to leave them in the comment section below or just open an issue in the YouTube repo. Um, I'll put the links in the description and everything, all the resources, everything that I've used to create this video are over there, uh, namely the links. Keep up to date with my channel because there will be two more videos related to this same project where I will explore things like uh, signals in Angular, uh, reactive programming and getting all of these uh, services in a reactive way working together to give optimal output of data, input of data, and to get all of this mesh working. And then finally, there will be a third video of these of, of for this project that will explore all of the advanced features that Kuma has to offer. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this video. I have one thing that I want to say again, uh, and that is that I'm doing this as a Kong champion. Uh, although I am not affiliated with Kong in any way. Uh, and uh, I do this for fun. I do this because I like to share knowledge and because I want to share my knowledge with, uh, with you and things that I have learned and how that experience went along with me. Um, so yeah, so if you have questions about any of the topics that I've uh, 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 talked about today, please feel free to leave a comment or just participate more in the community tab of this channel. Um, thank you so much for watching. And um, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe uh, to the channel to keep up to date with uh, further uh, uh, videos that I will be posting. And uh, don't forget to check the scribed website and slide share where I will be posting these slides there. Uh, if you think they are useful for you, you'll be able to download them for free there. And, uh, and uh, yeah, until the next video, have a good one. As a short disclaimer, I'd like to mention that I'm not associated or affiliated with any of the brands eventually shown, displayed or mentioned in this video.